Hi, everybody. Welcome to reality. This is Dr. Mandic, and we are doing Introduction to Philosophy. This is the last lecture in the Metaphysics unit. So far, we've done the Metaphysics of Space and Infinity, the Metaphysics of Motion and Change, the Metaphysics of Time itself, Metaphysics of Persons and their Survival, the Metaphysics of ordinary objects, things with parts, piles of sand. In each of these cases, we're examining reality at its most basic levels and trying to access what there is to access through reason alone. What is the very nature of time? What can we know about it by reason alone? Can we give an argument by reason to a priori knowledge that time travel is impossible or Vice versa, could we know a priori that time travel is possible? Now we're going to turn the metaphysical lens to reality itself. What is the reality of reality? Is reality really real? <laughs> you might think, well, yeah, by definition, reality is uh, that which is real. So it's a stupid question. Is reality really real? But maybe what reality really is, is it's in your mind. And so it's not really real. It's more like an illusion, like everything is an illusion, or everything is an idea or, or made out of ideas. Maybe most of what people generally take to be real isn't real at all, and the only thing that exists is your mind, and you've got a bunch of ideas in your mind, and there's really no difference between hallucinating and um, just plain old regular perceiving. So we're going to be discussing this topic of the reality of reality, by contrasting two opposing philosophical views, idealism and realism. Realism is the view that there is a reality outside of the mind. We might say that re realism is the view that there are things that exist independently of minds. There are things that exist independently of you perceiving them to exist. That's realism. Idealism says no, whatever is real is always conditioned by the mind. What is real is always relative to the mind. The only things that exist, exist in a dependent fashion. They depend on the mind for their dependence. We're going to break this video lecture up into four parts. First, we're going to be talking about philosophical theories of perception. Some of you, especially psychology majors, may have been exposed to theories of perception. But those would be scientific theories of perception. Those would be theories that tell you things like um, the way human vision works and, and how light is focused by the lens in your eyes onto the, the retina. And then rods and cones transduce electromagnetic radiation into electrochemical signals that are sent to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then eventually to the primary visual cortex and and then uh, forward through cortical regions all the way up to the frontal lobes. That's not at all what we're talking about here in philosophy land when we talk about theories of perception. We're talking about something like, what's the definition of perception? Regardless of whether a creature has a brain or has eyes or not, what sorts of things can we know a priori about what they have to do in order to perceive? And what is the relationship from a philosophical point of view, between the perceived and the perceiver. That's the sort of thing we're interested in when we talk about theories of perception. And one of the biggest problems facing understanding perception philosophically is to understand the ways in which perception might be false or misleading. The topic of illusions is this philosophical topic. Of course, there's a psychology of illusions, a neuroscience of illusions, there are magicians that train for years to create illusions that I don't have the skill to create. I couldn't make a ball seem like it disappeared, let alone make an elephant seem like I sawed it in half or whatever. So there's a lot of like good scientific and practical knowledge about illusions. But again, we're interested in the philosophical point of view. Like what is the, what in a more general or metaphysical sense are illusions and what are their implications for things like questioning what perception is, what the nature of the, re re of the real world is. There's epistemological stuff, too, about whether the very existence of illusions undermines any knowledge claims. 
Then we're going to talk about a, a very famous application of the concept of illusion, and that is something known as the argument from illusion. The argument from illusion is supposed to have implications regarding the nature of reality, but also uh, the, uh, the nature of our knowledge of reality, so it's epistemological in addition to metaphysical. And then we're going to look at some classic arguments for idealism from Berkeley. That looks like it's spelled Berkeley, like in Berkeley, California, and it is, but it's not pronounced like Berkeley. It's pronounced like Berkeley, like uh, a dog barking, Berkeley. Sorry, that's philosophy for you. The terminology is terrible. So are the people's names. But you got to pronounce it Berkeley or Berkeley or whatever you want. Do what you want. I don't care. Just get good answers on the quiz. Uh, okay, let's do the next thing, which is to jump into philosophical theories of perception. And as I indicated, we're interested in something very different from what, say, a psychologist or a, a medical doctor would be interested in, in dealing with perception. We want to know, like, in general, in the most general, abstract, a priori knowable way, what, what enables a perceiver to perceive what is real? There's a couple different views about that. Um, and I come from a part of the world where couple means like maybe three. A couple In the Chicago suburbs, we say a couple tree of those. So there's three theories of perception we're going to be investigating. One of them is known as indirect realism. And there's a picture depicting indirect realism. I'll say a little bit about what these arrows mean, why there's an eyeball on that guy's head. Anyway, the three theories of, of perception are uh, first indirect realism, a second one called direct realism, and then finally something called idealism. Let's start with indirect realism. So here is a person and uh, like many persons they have sensory organs. The nose is probably a tongue for tasting. Those are all sensory organs and they have eyes for seeing. It kind of doesn't matter. Philos philosophers are very abstract so we don't even care what kind of sensory organs we're talking about. But let's focus on vision just for the heck of it. Although we could have done this using other senses besides vision, vision and seeing things. So here's a person and they are seeing a spoon. That's, that's an example of something that you could perceive. You can have a visual perception of a spoon. And remember the question is, how do we perceive what's real? Well, one of the things that you perceive is a spoon, right? When it's true that you're perceiving a spoon, from a philosophical point of view, what has to be happening? Indirect realism is one of the answers. Direct realism is a different answer. Idealism is a different answer still. When you're perceiving a spoon, according to the indirect realist, well, there's actually not a direct relationship to the spoon, but there's only an indirect relationship. Yes, there is really a spoon, and you're somehow related to that spoon, but your mind's relationship to the spoon is mediated by an idea of the spoon. So I've got the big spoon out here in the external world outside of the mind of the perceiver. And then inside the mind, you know, you should know in philosophy and also in psychology and cognitive science, when you see a picture of a bald head in profile, that's the, that's the mind. The mind is a bald head. Um, and inside this bald head is a spoon. That's supposed to be the idea of a spoon. Yeah, I hope we all appreciate that if you were to literally open up someone's head, you probably shouldn't find a spoon in there. Um, although if you go in for like a major surgery, one of the things they do after surgery is they, they, uh, they do an inventory of all their instruments to make sure they are on the outside of you and not left on the inside. And I guess once in a while, someone will leave a wristwatch inside of a patient or you go, come on. Um, we're talking about spoons. There's no spoon. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so there's the idea of the spoon, and uh, it's depicted by a little spoon, and hopefully you appreciate you don't have like a Barbie doll miniature spoon inside of your brain. And if you do, you should call a doctor immediately. You also appreciate that you don't have a literal eyeball inside of your brain, um, but we often talk about the inner eye. 
the the inner eye is a metaphor for your inner awareness, your ability to become aware of the contents of your mind. And one of the things that you're aware of, uh, presumably, are your own ideas. So indirect realism is stating that when you perceive a spoon in the so-called external world, you're not directly related to the, the spoon. You're directly related to an idea of the spoon. And by being so related, that puts you in a position to have an indirect relationship to the actual real spoon. One way of thinking about this is imagining you are the pilot of a giant robot. And when you're inside of, say, the cockpit, which is located in the robot's head, you are watching TV screens and you're listening to speakers. And the TV screens are hooked up to video cameras in the robot's eyes. And the speakers are hooked up to microphones in the robot's ears. And you are trying to drive the robot around based on, on this information that you perceive on the TV screens or, or hear coming through the speakers. You um, are maybe driving this robot or flying the robot uh, or you know piloting the robot under the water. And uh, if you were out there in the water, you'd be crushed to death by the enormous pressures. Or maybe you're flying the robot through the heart of the sun and you're going to be burned, burned up if you're out there. So you're not directly interacting with any of the stuff out there. The robot is. You're on the inside controlling the robot. Um, so the robot uh, is going to do battle with a giant spoon, and you inside don't directly perceive the spoon. What you directly perceive is the image of the spoon on the TV screen on the inside of the robot's head. So indirect realism is kind of saying that you're, uh, you're the pilot inside a giant robot. The giant robot is your so-called human body, and the pilot is your mind. Your mind is on the inside, and the mind has direct access to its own ideas, its own representations. And, and based on having those inner representations, you draw a conclusion that maybe they are caused by some external reality, that maybe the idea of the spoon that you have on the inside of your head is caused by an actual spoon on the outside of your head. Now this might remind you of some of the problems that arise when we talked about skepticism and stuff about brains and vats, and that's good. It's good that that reminds you of it, because you might say there's a big problem with this indirect realism stuff. If you don't have direct access to this so-called real reality on the outside of your mind, how do you know there is any such thing? Wouldn't it follow that you could never know? And if you think that you ought to be able to know, then maybe this idea that there's a bunch of ideas in between you and the rest of reality is a bad idea. Maybe if we do actually have knowledge of an external reality, we need a different picture of how perception works. And that brings us to our next theory of perception, which is direct realism. Notice what changes when we change the picture from indirect realism to direct realism. One thing that's changed is um, you don't have a little eyeball inside of the head anymore. There's no little inner spoon. What is the same is there's still a perceiver. There's still the bald head representing the human mind. And there's still the big spoon out there in external reality. But with the direct realist, perception is a matter of the perceiver and the spoon. And there's some kind of relation between the two. Now, what enables that relation? Well, that's a good question. You should go ask your auto mechanic or a doctor or something like that. And they can tell you like whether you have eyeballs or not, or whether you've got super like a tentacle that's reaching out and touching the, the spoon. The philosopher doesn't care. What the philosopher cares about is whether in order to see the spoon, you have to somehow be aware of an idea in your mind. And philosophers who identify with direct realism say, no, that's that's stupid. You don't need to have an idea of a spoon in your mind that you're aware of, and then you make some kind of educated guess to a real spoon. The way perception works, according to a direct realist, is there's you and there's a spoon, and you perceive the spoon, the end. End of story. All this extra stuff that the indirect realist brings in is just a bad idea. It's like over, overly complicated, and it's going to lead to all sorts of terrible things like skepticism. Now, you might say, that sounds great. Direct realism doesn't lead to the problems of indirect realism. Sign me up. I want to be a direct realist. Now hold on there, student, before you jump on the uh, with all the other kids and become a direct realist, you've got some problems that you've got to solve. One of them is the problem of illusion. 
How is it possible for there to be illusions? You might say, uh, <laughs> what? What do you mean, how is it possible for there to be illusions? Well, how about another sort of example? Instead of uh, an illusion, something very similar to an illusion, a hallucination, or how about a dream? You can have a super realistic dream that you're looking at a spoon, even though there aren't any spoons around for miles. Isn't that possible? You might say, yeah, sure, it's possible. Well, how is it possible? Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't what's going on there is that you're like aware of the idea of a spoon and you mistake it for a real spoon? Isn't that what's going on? You might say, yeah, that, right, that makes sense. You might even say, a priori, that has to be what's happening. If you can have a very vivid awareness as if looking at a spoon, even though there's no spoon around, then you've got to be aware of something and just call that the idea of a spoon. That's what you're aware of is the idea of a spoon. So there's got to be instances, instances which we call illusions, in which what you're aware of is the idea of a spoon. Well, now, um, <laughs> given how similar perceiving an actual spoon is to hallucinating a spoon, uh, wouldn't the natural suggestion be that really what's happening, even in the so-called perceptual case or the, the so-called non-hallucinatory case, wouldn't the natural conclusion be indirect realism, namely that you're aware of the idea of a spoon even when you're not hallucinating. So indirect realism might have problems, but it also has solutions. And one of the things it has a solution to is the problem of illusion. How do you explain how illusions are possible? It's hard to see on direct realism how you can have hallucinations. It, seems, it would seem to posit an awareness uh, that it involves direct contact with an idea of a spoon. Now there's this third option, which is idealism. Note the differences and similarities between idealism and direct realism and indirect realism. So idealism, like indirect realism, has the little eyeball inside of the head. That's the inner awareness of the inner spoon. So both the idealist and the indirect realist has this important role for the little spoon, the, the idea of a spoon. But there's this big difference between the idealist and both the direct and indirect realists, and there is no spoon. For the idealist, there's no real spoon. There's no external world spoon. The only spoon is the idea of a spoon. And that's what they mean in the Matrix when they say there is no spoon. The Matrix is propaganda for idealism. And uh, you've been warned. You've been warned. Um, and you might say, that's fine. Uh, sign me up. I want to be an idealist. I like that. Everything's in my mind. I don't have to worry about anything else. Just take care of myself. The entirety of reality is just whatever I think it is. It sounds awesome. It's great. Well, it, okay, if that's true, why are you so miserable? Why don't you just wish yourself to be happy? That's my question to you. Anyway, let's talk about these three theories in comparison. We've got direct realism, indirect realism, and idealism. And you should note, because it's going to be on the quiz, but also because you want to know how perception works, you should note what the similarities are and what the differences are. So the similarities between direct realism and indirect realism have to do with the real spoon and a relationship between the perceiver and the real spoon. Now the direct realist is just the perceiver directly related to the spoon, where for the indirect realist, the relationship is kind of cold. You got a blue arrow instead of a pink arrow. It's kind of cool and distant. The the pink arrow for the indirect realist is between the eye and the idea of a spoon. So what you're directly aware of for the indirect realist is the idea itself, and you only indirectly perceive the mind-independent external world spoon. Indirect realism on the inside is very different from direct realism on the inside. But on the outside, direct realism and indirect realism are very similar. When we compare indirect realism to idealism on the inside, it's very much the same. There's this inner awareness, this introspection of the idea of a spoon. But the idealist rejects, rejects that there's anything independent of the mind that is at all important to explaining perception. Perception simply is the direct awareness of our own ideas. There's no such thing as mind-independent objects. Which theory is best? We've indicated a little bit some of the some of the pros and cons. Um, 
with indirect realism, you get an explanation of how you can be fooled by illusions. You don't get that from direct realism. But direct realism guarantees that you have, it seems at least better at guaranteeing you have knowledge of the external world, where indirect realism would seem to lead to skepticism. And idealism is a solution to skepticism that we've discussed already. You, you solve the problem of how you can have knowledge of the external world by just getting rid of the external world. And you might say, yeah, great. I did that years ago and I've never been happier. But you might say solving problems that way is kind of like getting your head chopped off to get rid of a headache. It's like a little bit too, too extreme. And maybe um, before we jump on the extreme solution, we should try something a little more mild. I want to move to our next unit, talk a, a little bit more about illusions just by themselves before we get deeper into the, the theories of, um, of perception. So it's good to have examples of illusions when we talk about this stuff. And I, I'll say it again, but, I'll, but uh, I should mention that um, when philosophers talk about illusions, they mean something much more broad than illusions properly so-called. When, when philosophers talk about illusions, they mean like not just plain old illusions, but also hallucinations and dreams. And um, strictly speaking, a dream is not the same as an illusion. And a hallucination is not the same as an illusion. What we're going to look at right now are illusions properly so-called. One big difference between an illusion and a dream is that with an illusion, you're probably awake. Uh, with a dream, you're probably asleep. Um, also, hallucinations are, it seems safe to say, not normal. Um, if, if you're having a hallucination, there's probably something something wrong with you. Maybe you, you did some drugs you're not supposed to be doing, or, or you're sick, you've got a really bad fever. Um, there are certain cases in which, uh, under circumstances we might call normal, you might still have uh, a hallucination. So there's, um, there's a kind of uh, hallucination, an auditory hallucination that is very common that happens right before you uh, fall all the way asleep and, or right after uh, you start waking up. They're called hypnopompic and hypnogogic uh, auditory hallucinations. And some of you have had them. I experienced them when I'm like sitting in a chair and trying to read at night and I like start to drift off and I'll, he I'll hear like really vividly, like my mom call out my name and my mom lives thousands of miles away and her, her voice isn't that loud. It's probably a hallucination and not really my mom calling my name. Um, but I'm not on drugs. Trust me. Uh, I'm not sick either. It's, that's a kind of a normal thing, but usually when something, um, fools you that, uh, that severely and it's not a dream and uh, everything is operating normally, we call that an illusion. So here's an illusion, this perceptual illusion right now. It's a, a visual illusion of, of, of motion. Um, and I should mention, like not everyone is going to see these illusions. Everyone's a little bit different. And so some of you might look at this and say, I don't see anything moving. I don't know what you're talking about, Mandic. But others will look at this and say, oh my God, I'm going to throw up. I see so much weird, like writhing snake motion going on especially like if i if i look away a little bit so like kind of out of the corner of your eyes or as you like move your eyes from here to here you get this feeling of these like snakes like moving or twisting or something like that it's, it's a little bit unsettling i hope no one gets sick to their stomach here's another one that might make you upset um it's another motion illusion you have like an intense feeling of like the the screen is just like wiggling or moving or something like that. And some people will have it so severely, they think that we're actually looking at a video instead of a, a still image. Um, here's a, yet another visual illusion. And this one has to do with a perception of color and specifically uh, different shades of gray. So um, the picture here on the left side of the screen and the picture here on the right side of the screen are really the same, except for on the right side, there's this bar, this vertical bar. And let's talk about what that means. So uh, look on the image on the left hand side. Most people would look at this and say we've got like a checkerboard chessboard type thing. with The green cylinder on the chessboard 
and it's casting a bit of a shadow. And there's two regions on the chessboard. Uh, one of them is labeled region A, and one of them is labeled region B. And I think a lot of you would perceive that region A is one of the dark regions. A checkerboard is a, a, an array of alternating light and dark squares. And this is one of the dark squares, A. And B is one of the light squares. So a lot of you would perceive that this region here, A, is darker than this region, B. Um, and you might also appreciate that, like, well, you know, region B is in a shadow. The shadow is being cast by the green object. And region B, even though it's one of the light regions, it is darker than this region, which is a light region that is not in the shadow. But nonetheless, I think you'd be really surprised if I told you that the, that the light, the amount of gray, in region B is exactly identical to the amount that's in region A. Region A and region B, considered as regions on your flat video screen, are the same shade of gray. And this vertical bar is helping you see that. Although for some of you, the illusion is going to be so strong that it's going to seem to you like this bar, which, believe me, is uniform gray, is darker here and the bar like gets lighter here. If you see it like that, well, wow, you're getting a double illusion. You're really getting your money's worth. But others will see that, wow, once you put the bar there, it really helps you see that A and B um, are, the, are the, actually the same shade of gray. So that's a, that's a, these first two illusions are, are visual illusions of motion. This is an illusory perception of motion. You perceive there to be motion when in reality there is no motion. That's not moving. Here is a color illusion. You perceive this to be a darker shade of gray uh, than this. In reality, they're the same shade of gray. And here's a, here's a perception of uh, size that is illusory. Um, and you might say this is also counts as a shape illusion. Um, and you might say, well, what's the illusion here? You've got a long table, and then you've got kind of a fat table. What's the illusion? Well, the illusion, my friends, is that this shape... The shape that defines this, this tabletop is exactly the same as the shape that defines this tabletop. And when I first was shown this illusion, when I was a student, the professor said this to us and I said, uh, with all due respect, get out of here. No way. There is no way that this is the same as this. And he took a transparency and he traced this and he rotated it and he put it over onto this one and it blew my mind. I couldn't believe that they were indeed the same shape. And I'm going to try to recreate that for you a little bit right now. So you can see what I've done is I've taken the image and made it slightly transparent and rotated it slightly and then plopped it down. So if you'd like tilt your head a little bit, you can see like what I have done here is taken the right tabletop and lifted it up and plopped it down onto the left tabletop. And you can see that it's the same shape. And on this next slide here, I do the, the same thing, only opposite. I take the the right tabletop, and I plop it down onto the left tabletop. So you might think what you're doing is perceiving two different shapes, but really you are misperceiving the same shape. You're having an illusory perception of difference, but in reality, there's just the same shape. Same shapes, same size. And I had already said before, but I'll say it again, there's a difference between illusions, dreams, and hallucinations, and it has to do with things like which one requires you to be awake, versus asleep, which one happens kind of on a normal or regular basis, which one is an indication of some kind of illness or, or toxicity. With these visual illusions that we looked at, you know, most of you are normal. I mean, I haven't met you personally. Uh, I can't vouch for you, but I'm going to guess you're pretty normal. Nonetheless, you are experiencing these illusions. Um, but from a philosophical point of view, illusions and hallucinations and dreams are all kind of the same because they are all examples in which things are not the way they seem. There's a very vivid appearance that does not match reality. And now what do we do about that as philosophers? What do we say about that? Well, one of the things that we say about that is something called the argument from illusion. And I indicated the argument from illusion a little bit back when we were discussing uh, earlier in this video, the main rationale for preferring indirect realism over direct realism. That was the argument from illusion. I'm going to go through it in a little more care and detail right now. So here we go, spelling out the argument. Um, step one or premise one 
illusions are subjectively indistinguishable from accurate perceptions. So let's take, for example, um, a dream, like a really vivid dream. Like I said, from a philosophical point of view, for all sakes and purposes, we can treat illusions and hallucinations and dreams as being pretty much the same general phenomenon, the, th the general phenomenon of appearances not matching reality. So let's have a, uh, as an example, a super, super realistic dream. And examples of realistic dreams would include like the really boring ones, like when you um, dream you're at work, <laughs> and like there's no one flying around, there's no monsters, you're not like a, you, you know, you don't show up to school naked or something like that. It's just a plain old boring day at work. Um, I work as a philosophy professor, so when I have a dream that I'm at work, I have dreams that I'm telling students about dreams, and uh, things get very, very weird really fast. But in one of these dreams, I was inviting the students to look at the backs of their hands. And, you know, if you're like me, you've got a lot of hair on the back of your hand. Um, and if you don't have any hair on the back of your hand, you probably have little lines or dots or veins or something like that. And I was inviting the students to look at, like, all the details on the back of their hands or to look at the, the surfaces of their desks and appreciate, like, the amazing detail of wood grain on the on their desks, or to look out the window and look at the branches in the tree and all the leaves on the trees, and the amazing detail of just like the way the light was reflecting off of different parts of the scene. And I said, isn't it completely unbelievable that this would be a dream? Isn't it obvious that this is real reality? And I said that, and then I woke up, and I thought, oh, snap, I just Descarted myself. Um, so we have all had at least once in some kind of dream or maybe some maybe you had a hallucination you had a bad fever it led to a hallucination or maybe with certain illusions you've all had cases in which there was something that was not an accurate perception you're not accurately perceiving what was really happening but on the inside it seemed like it was subjectively it was indistinguishable from the real thing you had this mental state, this illusory mental state that subjectively was distinguishable from having an accurate perception. That's the first premise. The first premise is stating that that happens at least sometimes. The second premise says that in those cases, when, for example, you're dreaming that you're flying over a waterfall, even though there's no waterfall for thousands of miles around, or you're hallucinating that you heard your mother call your name, or you're, you're having an illusion that there is... Uh, two different colored tiles where really they're the same. Um, when you're experiencing the illusion, you're experiencing something. It's not like you're not aware of anything at all. When you're dr having a dream about a waterfall, you're not aware of nothing. Um, examples of someone being aware of nothing would be like dreamless sleep or uh, may being dead, uh, although that makes assumptions about whether there's an afterlife. But maybe, you know, probably dead people don't experience anything at all. Um, that's an example of experiencing nothing, being in, a, in a dreamless sleep, fully unconscious. Um, but when you're experiencing an illusion, when you're having a vivid dream, there's something that you're aware of. Well, what is that something? It's not a real spoon. It's not a real waterfall. What is it then? Call it the idea of a waterfall or the idea of a spoon. So that leads us to our third premise. Uh, we are led from the second premise to the third premise. When I'm experiencing illusion, I'm aware of something. That says, says the second premise. Third premise, what I'm aware of then is an idea. So given that the accurate perception is subjectively indistinguishable from the hallucination, and given that the hallucination involves the direct awareness of an idea, the accurate perception must involve the direct awareness of the idea. So this is the argument from illusion. And one way of interpreting the argument from illusion is that it's an argument for indirect realism. So another way of putting that very point is that it is an argument against direct realism. But that leaves us with a choice between indirect realism and idealism. So we've got this argument, this argument from illusion, that is basically saying that when you have 
so-called accurate perceptions, what is directly before your mind is an idea, and you're having an awareness of an idea. Okay, so that puts us in this like eyeball inside the head kind of territory. But now what else is going on? Is there anything else going on? Um, the idealist says, no, there's nothing else going on. There's just this inner awareness of the idea. And the indirect realist says, no, there's, in addition to the inner awareness, there's some kind of conclusion that you can draw about what's causing that. There's something in the external world that's causing you to have that appearance or idea. So how do we decide? How do we weigh which is superior, idealism versus indirect realism? What we're going to do now is just to take a quick little look at some arguments for idealism. And those arguments come from a very uh, famous source, and that is the philosopher Barclay, Bishop George Barclay. He's one of uh, many uh, 17th and 18th century philosophers from the Euro uh, European philosophical tradition. And uh, I've mentioned this before, the, these philosophers divide up into these camps of the rationalists versus the empiricists. And then there's Kant, who kind of tries to combine rationalism and empiricism into this thing that Kant calls transcendental idealism. So Barclay was, a, like Hume, and uh, also Locke, was an empiricist, and that was his epistemology. But now we're going to focus on his metaphysics, his view of reality, on how, and, and how reality doesn't exist independently of the mind. So before we get into our formal discussion of Barclay's arguments, we're going to have a small amount of fun, and uh, it's still useful, and we're going to watch one of these um, three-minute philosophy things. Uh, this one is going to be about uh, Barclay. It's nice to, to have these little, uh, little videos because they give you a, a break, they give you a bit of a refresher, they give you a slightly different point of view, and at least some of you will find at least some of it amusing, and that's good for your brain. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, drink some water, and then you're gonna and you're gonna watch the video. When I'm done drinking my water, you'll be done watching the video. Okay, uh, Barclay uses Locke's definitions to eliminate the material world. Whoa, I know, man. Hey, man, what you reading? Just whatever I want, man. Okay, Mr. I think I'm so cool. Hey, I'm reading some philosophy, man. <laughs> philosophy? Okay, whatever. Hey, I love the wisdom. You love the wisdom? Well, what, well, who are you reading? Well, I'm reading a book. About? About how Barclay uses Locke's definition to eliminate the material world. What? That, what? Man, you're crazy. I know, man. I never thought I'd blow up like a firestone tire. I know. So why don't you explain me? Give me some of these, this wisdom. Alright. Check, check it out. This philosophy is iced out like hockey. Once upon a time, John Locke was chilling, being his British philosopher self. Check him out, he is so fun. When he started thinking about human knowledge, he didn't agree with the ideas of Descartes and decided to challenge them. Yeah, I'll come straight our sucker. Cut him up old school! He felt that a blank mind would be simpler in explanation than Descartes. This. So he started thinking about the idea of tabula rasa. Blank slate fool. The mind begins completely empty and is filled by sensory experience and acts of reflection. <laughs> Snack attack. Yeah, crazy delicious. Locke made a distinction between types of physical qualities. Primary, simple, and secondary, complex. Primary qualities are the most basic of physical objects. Size, shape, density, solidity, street cred, rep, etc. <laughs> Secondary qualities are combinations of simpler ideas. Color, shape, odor, flavor. The bling you be swinging. Primary qualities are inherent to real objects, substances. And the secondary qualities we attribute to real objects actually exist only in the mind. <laughs> Y'all be tripping. He really had no definite definition of substance. Say what? Once upon a time, some other time, this Barclay guy. No, not Charles Barclay. George Barclay. George Barclay. He was chilling in Dublin, being Irish and whatnot, when he started reading some Locke. He was impressed with Mr. Locke's work, and he wanted to get some of his inconsistencies. Get your facts straight, son. Barclay attacked Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. He argued that since our only way to know the inherent primary qualities is through some external secondary qualities, and these qualities are purely mental, that the physical world does not exist and is only in the mind. Essay is per cheapy. Dang! To help explain this, he made a distinction between direct perception and indirect perception. Getting crazy up in her. A child looks like a piece of paper and sees the shapes of letters. The secondary, direct perception qualities, but does not understand the words. Alright, I got this, I think. Over time, the child can understand the meaning of the letters, the primary qualities, and direct perception. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I got this, man. Alright, okay, so the things we see are really only collections of ideas. However, rooms not disappear while you're not in them, because God, the regularity, and predictability of sense data is constantly perceiving everything. Jeez.
Hope you enjoyed that. Maybe even learned something. Okay, so what's on the table right now? We've got three different theories of perception. We're trying to decide which one's the best one. This argument from illusion has eliminated direct realism from the running, but that leaves us with a decision between idealism versus indirect realism. And now we're going to look at four arguments from Barclay, all in favor of idealism. And uh, while we can go on for hours and hours and hours about all this stuff, we're just going to end it after these ones. So the four arguments from Barclay, there's something called the argument from pain. There's something called the argument from perceptual relativity. This also gets referred to as Barclay's bucket. There's this argument of his in which he talks about how nothing can resemble an idea but another idea. And then there's an argument he calls the master argument. The reason he calls it the master argument is something like uh, he seems to think that it's his best argument. Maybe he's right. Uh, or maybe it's his worst argument. But anyways, let's start with the argument from pain. All of these arguments have idealism as their conclusion. Let's start with the argument from pain. Okay, and it's probably useful to keep in mind throughout all of these arguments that Barclay is a kind of empiricist, and, and recall the empiricist thinks everything uh, that is in the mind comes first through the senses. And... Um, one of the things that comes in through the senses is pain. We feel pain. And sometimes we feel pain when we burn ourselves. Sometimes we feel our pain, uh, pain when we like get a cut. You accidentally cut yourself with a kitchen knife while you're slicing some bread or some cheese or something like that. Um, and uh, now, that's a sensory perceptual episode. Like, uh, there's lots of things you, you perceive in, in life, and some of them are colors, and some of them are shapes, but some of them are pains. And uh, now, Barclay invites us to consider the question of whether the pain exists out there in the knife. Was there a pain inside of the knife just waiting for your, you to feel it? Like the knife is filled with pain, and then when you cut yourself, the pain goes into you? Do you think that's what's happening? Uh, the fire is filled with heat. The fire emits light. But does the fire have pain inside of it? I think a lot of people would say no. Fire causes pain, but fire does not have pain in it. The pain is in your mind. The external source causes the pain in your mind. The knife doesn't have pain in it. The knife can cause pain, but the pain just exists in the mind. Okay, well, now Barclay says, let's take this a step further. Consider some other things that you can have a sensory experience of. Like, for example, brightness. The fire is bright. Now, if the fire gets bright enough, it will hurt to look at it, right? The very, a very, very bright light just is a painful stimulation, right? And now you say, hmm, okay, Barclay, well, maybe, yes, I'll grant you that. That a very bright, a very bright light is pain. And a very loud sound, like there are certain sounds that are so loud, it just hurts to hear them. And that loud sound is painful. So if pain exists in your mind, and if a l bright light is pain, then the bright light exists inside of your mind. Haha, -ha. see where this is going? This is the argument from pain. You start with the assumption that pain is in your mind. Then we show that there's some other things, like for example, the brightness or the loudness that are pains. And so they would exist in the mind also. But now let's take the difference between a loud noise and a quiet noise. What's the difference there except there's just more noise? And if the very loud noise exists inside of your mind, doesn't the quiet noise exist inside of your mind too? If a very bright light exists inside of your mind, doesn't a very dim light also exist inside of your mind? Now, pretty rapidly, you can get the entire sensible world existing just inside of your mind because every property that is sensible can be turned up to 11. And once, once you crank it up from like 0 to 11, you have it at such an extreme level that it is painful. 
And you might say, well, okay, that works for some things, like like really sour candy, that's painful. And uh, like really things that are really sweet, that, oh, ugh, that's kind of, ay, 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 it's suffering to have something that is too sweet in your mouth. That might be plausible for something that's really sour, or something that's really hot, or something that's really loud. But how about something that's really blue? Can something be painfully blue? If not, then Barclay's argument sucks. But if so, if there is such a thing as like, maybe a really intense blue is very, very bright. Very, very bright blue. And um, that would be painful, and so therefore Barclay wins. But there's other things, like how about black? Well, maybe black is just the absence of white. And uh, so, yes, something that's a black color, very, very dark, is not painful. But that's not an actual positive sensory stimulus. It's the absence of a sensory stimulus. The presence of a sensory stimulus would be like very bright blue or very bright white. And those are painful when turned up. Anyway, that's the gist of the argument from pain. It goes like this. Step one, pains don't exist in the external world. There's no pain living inside the knife waiting to jump into your hand. The knife causes you to have pain. Step two, very bright lights are themselves pain. Step three, very bright lights must therefore exist in your mind because pain exists in your mind and they are pains. Uh, that I lost count, but the next step then is that not like lights that aren't bright, that are dim, they exist in your mind too. Because a bright light is just more dim light, and if the bright light exists in your mind, then the dim light must exist in your mind also. Next argument, let's talk about the bucket. So um, here is a bucket, and it is filled with water that is not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. We call it room temperature water. Now suppose you have two hands and you're going to take one hand and stick it in the water and you take the other hand and stick it in the water, but wait, before you do that, first you're going to take one hand and grab a snowball. You're going to get some snow in your hand and mush it or stick your, stick your hand on an ice cube or something like that or run it on some very cold water. And you're going to take your other hand and you're going to heat it up. You're going to make it really warm, run it under some hot water. So one hand has been touching something very cold and the other hand is going to be touching something very, very hot. And now you stick both hands in the bucket. What's going to happen? You all know what's going to happen, I think. The hand that was previously in the very cold is going to perceive this water as being quite warm. And the hand that was previously uh, in the very hot is going to perceive this bucket water as being quite cool. But now, if the temperature that your hands feel are objectively in the bucket, that leads to a contradiction. The one hand says the bucket is very warm. The, other, the, the bucket of water, the water in the bucket is very warm. The other hand says it's not very warm, but that's a contradiction. You can't have a contradiction in external reality. So what, temp, what is the temperature that you're feeling? It is simply the temperature inside of your mind. You can, you can do this for all sorts of other examples of perceptual relativity. So here the perception of temperature is relative to what temperatures you were previously experiencing. So it's an example of perceptual relativity. Another example of perceptual relativity would be the way things taste based on what you were tasting earlier. Some of you have had the, the, the unpleasant experience of uh, drinking some orange juice right after you brushed your teeth. It's a total rookie mistake. Uh, hopefully you don't do that anymore. But you should, you know that like orange juice tastes terrible after that, after you do that. I mean, some of you might like it uh, and do it on purpose, but I think most of you would agree that, yeah, orange juice tastes differently depending on what else you were tasting. Um, you might really, really enjoy, really enjoy the flavor of vanilla ice cream, unless you already ate 15 scoops of it. Then another mouthful of ice cream is just going to seem terrible. That's perceptual relativity. The way you perceive things is relative to what other things you perceive or what things you were perceiving at recent other times. And if you assume that what you're perceiving is what's in real reality, then these examples of perceptual relativity would indicate that real reality has contradictions in it. But that doesn't make any sense. You can't have real contradictions in real reality. 
So therefore, these contradictory percepts must be awarenesses of different ideas. You've got one idea of the temperature, that, and that idea came from having your hand in the hot water. And you've got the other idea of the temperature that came from having your hand in the cold water. But there's no temperatures in reality. It's just these ideas of temperature in your mind. Okay, this arg these arguments are going to get a little harder and a little weirder. So nothing but an idea can resemble idea in an argument. Is it starts off by assuming that the relationship between ideas and what their ideas of is a relationship of resemblance. And um, you might wonder, what? Why? Why did he just say that? Well, let's back up a little bit. Ideas and what they're ideas of uh, are related by what we might call representation. The one represents the other. Now, how does representation work? When one thing represents another thing, how does that work? Um, well, in some examples, the way it works is by resemblance. So I've got a picture of Barclay on the screen. I've also got a picture of an astronaut. I've got a picture of a pipe. Now, what makes the pipe a picture of a pipe? And you might say, well, the picture resembles the reality. So the reality, the real pipe, has a certain shape, and the picture has the same shape. A, um, a photograph on your ID, it represents you in part by resembling you. Now, the photograph of your face doesn't have the same size as your actual face, but it has the same shape. And if it's a color photograph, the colors in the photograph are the same colors as the colors on your face. If you've got blue eyes, then the photograph is going to have blue regions that represent the color of your eye in virtue of resembling them. So for at least some representations, representation is a matter of resemblance. Now, what could an idea possibly resemble? Could the idea of a pipe resemble an actual pipe? Well, Barclay says, the only thing that an idea can resemble is another idea. So if we think about anything at all, the only things we ever think about are ideas. We think with ideas, and what do we think about? Ideas. Now you might say, this is just really stupid. It's terrible. It's gone off the rails in so many ways. Aren't there other examples of representations besides pictures? Yes, maybe pictures represent in virtue of resemblance, but what about words? Now some words are examples of what are, is called onomatopoeia. That's when you've got a word that sounds like the thing it's supposed to be a word for. Like the word buzz. The word buzz makes a buzzing noise. Or the word growl. The word growl sounds like an animal growling. Growl. The, uh, the word bark or arf sounds like a dog noise. But there's other words that don't resemble the things that they're, they're words of. So take the, the word minuscule. The word minuscule is a very big word, but it means very small. Take the word big. It's only got three letters in it, but it's a, it's a small word. Um, I could take a black crayon and write the word white. I could take a blue crayon and write the word red. Language represents without necessarily having resemblance between the representation and what the representation is of, uh, a representation of. And maybe the way ideas are related to what their ideas of is more like linguistic representation than pictorial representation. And that suggestion seems to just help show that Barclay's argument is terrible, that it's just not necessary that an idea can only re re resemble another idea. Like, I'm, maybe resemblance has got nothing to do with representation, Barclay. That's the suggestion. Okay, let's get the master argument in here and then go pour buckets of water overhead because this is going to make your head feel like it's on fire. Okay, Barclay, after giving various arguments, said he had one argument that he would rest the whole case on the so-called master argument. Now, before we get into how this argument is supposed to work, let us remind ourselves that what we are arguing about is whether there is anything that exists independently of minds. So, some things plausibly have a mind-dependent existence. 
The question is, are there any other things? Are there things that have a mind-independent existence? It's probably a common sense view to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and so nothing is really beautiful independently of anyone's like perceptual reaction to it. Uh, and similar things apply to like whether things taste good. Like a, a vulture or a fly is going to have very different sense of taste and sense of preferences from you. You probably would not enjoy rotten meat, but a vulture would think that tastes delicious. You might like a fresh, a freshly baked. A uh, slice of bread with some butter on it, and a vulture would say that just is disgusting. It doesn't have any rotten meat in it at all. No, thank you. So you appreciate the some things, like whether something is delicious or, or disgusting, that only has a dependent status. It depends on the eye of the beholder. It depends on perceivers to perceive it that way. But how about like whether um, iron is heavier than helium? That not that objective? It thought, like even if no one perceived it, it would still be true that iron ha is heavier than helium. So common sense seems to indicate that while some things like beauty or being disgusting is mind dependent, other things like whether helium is lighter than iron is mind independent. But now Descartes, sorry, Barclay, not Descartes, Barclay, Barclay wants to say everything is mind dependent. Here's why. Think of a tree. By the way, I hope you noticed that there's a picture of a tree here, but it's also the picture of a bald head. And remember what I told you about bald heads. Bald heads represent the mind. So this is a tree, but it's also the mind. Now, uh, try to think of a tree. Go ahead. You're thinking of a tree right now. All right. Now, if there are such things as trees that no one ever thought of, go ahead and think about those trees. Are you doing it? Can you think about a tree that no one is thinking about? Oh no. The only trees that you can think about are trees that are thereby being thought about. And so there's no such thing you just can't even think of a tree that isn't being thought about. All the trees that you can think about have the property of being thought about by you. But the property of being thought about by you is a mind-dependent property. So you cannot even conceive of a tree that exists independently of being thought of. You can't conceive of any such thing, because anything that you conceive of will thereby be thought about. Any tree you can think of is thereby thought about. So it's inconceivable that there be such trees as so-called mind-independent trees. And if something is inconceivable, then it's impossible. So therefore, nothing exists independently of the mind. Or at least that's what the master argument says. Study question time. Let's study question. Study question. Whoa, what's this? It's a funny comic. At least, according to me, it's a funny comic. But like we said, beauty is in the eye of the holder. Uh, same with funny. Maybe you're not going to think this is funny at all. But I think it's hilarious. So there's some guy, he says, it's time for a reality check. So, question, is this reality? And then a cat with a hat and a skateboard says, yeah, totally. And he says, okay, good. And the cat flies away on its magical skateboard. I think that's hilarious. And... Uh, Now we're at the study questions. Study question number one. The conclusion of the argument from illusion is A, direct realism is true. B, direct realism is false. C, idealism is true. D, idealism is false. E, none of the above. Study question two. The conclusion of the argument from perceptual relativity is A, direct realism is true. B, direct realism is false. C, idealism is true. D, idealism is false. E, none of the above. Study question three. The conclusion of Barclay's bucket argument is A, direct realism is true, B, direct realism is false, C, idealism is true, D, idealism is false, E, none of the above. Now, since you are good students, you've thought about what the answers are and try to come up with the answers on your own before looking and seeing what the answers are. But now it's time to look and see what the answers are. Hopefully you got all three of these correctly.
and you selected B, C, C for the three questions. And now we are really at the end of the lecture. Okay, everybody, keep it real. Bye-bye. See you next time.